few weeks ago, I was uh, doing live sound at uh, an event in Stockholm. Uh, it was a, in the morning. It was a political event, like an election kickoff, and uh, there was this uh, woman sitting in a, in a in a corner, older lady, and she she didn't seem like she had she knew anyone else there. She was just sitting there, a bit introverted person. But after a while, she called me to her and she said, like, hey, you look like a guy who are into old tape recorders and, and uh, <laughs> that, that old style gear. And I was like, um, well, as a matter of fact, yeah, that's true. Um, this is me and my MCI JH24 tape recording machine. And uh, maybe it's a bit strange because I, I grew up uh, using mainly digital equipment and things like this. Uh, my father was, uh, it was in the 90s, my father was uh, an early adopter of uh, uh, the digital technology. He totally abandoned the, um, the tape recorders and everything. So throughout my childhood and teenage years and early 20s, I was only working in the digital domain, but I, I started becoming interested about tape sound. And, and that's tape sound, because I thought it was all about the sound. But more on that later. Uh, so in a sense, using these things, uh, you could say that I, I also grew up uh, making music with uh, quite some heavy limitations. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. My name is Eric Peterson. I just finished my master's on uh, the Royal College of Music in Stockholm. And uh, I have also made an album with very strict limitations, uh, stemming from the analog gear. So, um, limitations. Uh, I, I found this uh, pretty interesting uh, piece of literature uh, by Barry Schwartz. Does anyone know it? Um, he, he's talking about uh, everyday life and uh, choices and how, how, how an abundance, maybe overabundance of choices can make us feel less satisfied. Um, and that caught my interest because it's exactly what I'm, uh, what I think in terms of music production. That uh, the the modern digital era, when you we have like an unlimited amount of channels accessible and uh, as many plugins as you'd like, uh, and I noticed that productions take. Uh, speaking for myself, productions take uh, longer and longer time to finish, and you you kind of, you get disoriented by all the options. So I really wanted to try something different. And then I started thinking about a concept for recording. And I started calling that for, the, the concept, I named it uh, No Regrets. Which means that you take decisions early on, you don't go back and redo anything, and it's the performance in focus, uh, basically. Um, so, the first No Regrets recording session was my own album. I had written 10 songs, uh, my own songs, during a couple of years that I wanted to record anyway, so it was perfect material for that. Um, I uh, engaged uh, 14 musicians and four technicians. Uh, so we had uh, bass, drums, guitars, uh, keyboards, uh, string quartet, um, backing vocal singers, and also we had a tape operator, of course, and uh, uh, three other technicians uh, doing different things, just to, in order for me to, to being able to be the lead singer, basically. Uh, we could book two days of recording. Uh, that was quite short time frame for creating an album. Uh, so I decided that, um, yeah, and one of the uh, one of the things about that, this is for real, it's just going to be a release, regardless uh, what happens, I'm going to release. Maybe all the songs, maybe just a few songs, or it's going to be released, everyone should know that. And uh, also, the limitations. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the limitations that I chose. Um, because we had very limited time, I thought one hour studio time per song, including rehearsal, is maybe reasonable to get everything done. Um, 
I also only had uh, three pieces of uh, three rolls of two-inch tape, which is, uh, if you run it at half speed, it's uh, around 90 minutes. So it's uh, and the the total uh, uh, amount of minutes for the the whole album is 42. So it would hold the whole album twice. So average two takes per song. If we would hit like a one take, then uh, okay, we could maybe do three takes on another song. But uh, two takes per song was the general kind of rule. We recorded all music and the vocals in the same room, lead vocals, backing vocals, everything. Everyone was standing in a very big room and a few of you have been there uh, last year, I guess, in Stockholm. It was the same room with a big um, dome, sound dome, if you recall. Um, so it's a large room and I could get very good space in between the instruments, so, so leakage was not that big of a problem. Um, no overdubs and post-editing allowed. That meant whatever happened in that room, whatever got captured by all the mics, because we still did uh, separate channels recording, we did multi-track of course, but uh, anything that happened there uh, was supposed to stay there for the whole until the, uh, the record was finished. And uh, everyone uh, recording was aware of these uh, limitations. Uh, just a, a quick run through of the technology. Yeah, that's a photo from the very session. Um, you can see the tape recorder over there and the SSL. Uh, so we used mainly the GH24 MCI machine. Uh, but we also double tracked on Pro Tools because if something would happen to the tape recorder, we wouldn't have lost any of the material, and that felt important. Um, we were using the SSL duality console, and uh, we also used a, a Aviom uh, A16 monitoring system, so everyone can hear the uh, separate channels uh, mixing themselves. Um, with all these limitations, uh, I, I knew I, I could kind of see beforehand that this was going to generate some nervosity or psychological issues. So, uh, with that in mind, I also paid attention to uh, to make a very detailed planning, uh, and it was strict. It was like these one-hour shifts for every song. Uh, after each song was recorded, we had like a 15-minute break uh, for coffee and stuff, and, and we also had like a 90-minute um, lunch break uh, and dinner. Um, so, uh, and another point that I thought lots about was uh, uh, showing trust to the musicians that they really knew that you're in this because I, I love the way you're playing and, and you're the person who I want to be on this record, so feel free and, and use your own kind of voice. Uh, so, uh, a little bit of uh, emotional labor there, creating a, a safe feeling in the group was important. And uh, also important thing that I intended to do uh, was to focusing on the process and not the result, but we were there and then in the recording room and I tried to really make the process be the main thing. Um, afterwards, I, uh, uh, I designed a, a survey on uh, Google Forms, which I sent out to all the people that have been working on the recording. And uh, it contained some questions about their earlier experiences of recordings, like have they done something like this before or not, and uh, what was different with this particular recording session. Um, I also uh, asked them to value their individual and collective performance uh, free text so they could write freely about it uh, as much or as little as they liked. And uh, also I asked them to, um, to write about any positive or negative feelings they had experienced throughout the session. And um, the results from that survey was uh, very interesting. Um, first of all, uh, I just would like to show you this graph, uh, because it's so um, 
concrete. Um, the re restricted time per song, it was five out of, I think, uh, 13 respondents who had been in that situation before. Restricted amount of takes, well, there was only three of them who had been dealing with that limitation before. No overdubs, post-editing, five people, everyone in the same room, that was the most popular one that I, those um, yeah, musicians have been doing that more. But it's interesting that restricted amounts of takes seems, at least from this little poll and this little group of people, it seems like something unusual that this is something that doesn't normally happen in recording situations. Um, and uh, some more general um, responses was that uh, most of the feedback wa was uh, very positive and they, um, they, they told me they had a great time in the studio and they, had, they felt that their performance was good. Um, the group, they, they valued the group performance a bit higher than their own performance, their own individual performance. So I guess you're, you're more, uh, it's easier to criticize yourself than maybe the group and, and um, they, some of them were nervous and a few of them were nervous to that extent so that they played safe or felt constrained that they couldn't play exactly the way they wanted to because they were afraid of messing up or uh, playing something wrong that would damage the whole recording. So that was actually, that, that was something, uh, that, that was maybe a, a negative side of it, but uh, of course all that feedback is welcome because um, uh, you want, as a researcher, you don't only want the good news, <laughs> right? Um, it was very different, for, for most of them, it was very different from, from the, their earlier experiences. Um, and uh, what can be learned from doing this kind of project? Well, I, I got, the planning is very important, and that I got confirmed because uh, the respondents, they, many of them told me that, oh, the planning was amazing that we've never had such a schedule before and it was so easy to just relax and you know you could get, go and get lunch and you didn't have to think about anything except being on time and playing so so that and that was something that I uh, that I would have guessed before this uh, planning is, is very important I think uh, and that got confirmed here um, limitation of uh, choices uh, in, let's say, that we can only do two takes here. That was also something very, that I, I learned a lot from that, because uh, the results are maybe not the most perfect in, in a audio editing uh, perfectionist uh, way of thinking, but it's, uh, it's got other qualities that I don't think that I would have achieved with um, doing overdubs or, or editing a lot um, uh, and uh, and the third thing I learned was that the emotional labor and, and this also got uh, confirmed by the group a lot uh, like the, the um, group psychology um, thinking and that getting the group to feel like a safe team and uh, that was important during these circumstances because uh, of all the limitations they generate a lot, lot of uh, anxiousness and nervosity and then you have to kind of compensate for that. As a producer uh, and leader you have to compensate for that by being very sensible and uh, leaving a lot of the trust to, to the persons involved. Um, and workflow. Uh, this is uh, uh, connecting back to what I started with. Uh, I started with analog sound because I thought that the sound was the thing, uh, but working with it, I learned something else. The sound is marginal, to me now, the sound is marginal for working with tape. It's not what it's all about. It's about the workflow, and it's about having these limitations naturally in the technology. But the technology is uh, uh, forcing me to make decisions early, and to do things a certain way in a certain order, uh, and 
that I think is important. And I also think with, with uh, a, a lot of discipline, you can do this without using analog gear, of course. I mean, it's only about you being disciplined and sticking to your initial thoughts. Um, yeah, and um, now I've been talking a lot, and uh, I guess maybe one or two of you may be curious to hear something. So I cut together a little medley, uh, like Adix uh, medleys, but these are all my songs. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I beg your pardon, all the lyrics are in Swedish, so... Uh, uh, but it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on, on this. Actually, both of those. Uh, yeah. So um, we used the SSL desk. We did mix it from Pro Tools because uh, I recorded the tapes onto Pro Tools uh, because I didn't want to tear up the rolls of, of tape. Um, 
But uh, using Pro Tools as a tape machine, we did all the automation live. Uh, we were two or three people writing the faders of that uh, mix session, and we only used the uh, uh, MS2000 reverb in that studio. So <laughs> it was that was it. Yeah, Gary, hi. Well, the questions have answered some of my questions, but the one thing I thought was maybe worth mentioning was just the whole concept of recording to tape and then to digital is kind of like part of the digital paradigm. Like in the analog days, there was the thought of a backup was just not, I, I never thought of a backup mm -hmm. to tape. So even just that alone, and my question was going to be, did you use Pro Tools? We obviously did the mix, but did you yeah. have to for any of the reports? Did the tape machine? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I can tell you a secret. <laughs> it, it was actually um, one problem was that uh, this last uh, ballad that you heard, uh, it was on the first tape. Uh, uh, and that very tape, I had used to calibrate the machine before, and the erase head was not working properly. So you could hear test tones <laughs> and sweeps <laughs> behind that like very sensible ballad. Uh, and that was... Oh, that is like when I re I did not realize that until listening back a few days afterwards at the tapes. So then I took the decision to uh, because we had double tracked in Pro Tools, so we had exactly the same um, the same tracks digitally. So I actually <laughs> I hooked up the tape recorder and I transferred all those tracks onto a fresh tape okay, yeah. without any test yeah. tones on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, just to to have that sound. From the MCI because it's then then it would blend in with the other songs, uh, so everything has been on tape sooner or later. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, my question is not related to the, the process of recording, but what kind of music, written music, you have with, with, for the musicians? I understand the string mm -hmm. quartet should be fully yeah. written, but what about the the, the interaction? Uh, uh, the musician with the, the written music. What yeah. kind of rhythm music do you use? So, so I did. I, I made for the rhythm section musicians. I, I made really simple chord sheets mm -hmm. uh, only, and that's uh, with, with you can see the form and the different chords of the. Mm -hmm. But it's normal. So no no notation there. Uh, for the choir, we we rehearsed everything uh, by ear, and also some of the musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Individually, they, they prefer going by ear than uh, reading music. Right. So so it was a mix. But the strings, of course, were they, they yeah. I had to arrange the parts. Yeah, because I could I could hear some uh, specific feelings in, in during the, the, the performance. But yeah. I was wondering what kind of motivation that the musicians had. Yeah, mostly I, I picked those musicians. Most of them are friends of mine and. Uh, uh, or were, and now everyone is a friend of mine. There was some, some guy, the bass player, I didn't know before, uh, but I got a recommendation. And uh, uh, so uh, I, I, they were personally picked for, the, for doing that session. And uh, I wanted to have their soul in it, so that, that was the whole, that was their instruction just play, play it like you would play it. And uh, that generated a lot of interesting ideas that I wouldn't have thought of myself. Should we get one more question? Okay. Yeah. You mentioned that I think you mentioned there were 16 channels of monitoring. Yeah. So were the musicians wearing headphones? And if they yeah. were, why did you think it was necessary when they were all in the same room? And also, did you balance the instruments in the room or balance it on the desk at the end? And finally, did you use oboes between the instruments to try and control the scale? Yeah, we, um, you can start from uh, from the last question. We used a few goers, uh, like big screens, but but mostly it was the spacing in the room that made leakage. Uh, uh, of course, around the drums also, but but uh, it's a very large room, and we could have several meters between each musician and free line of sight. Uh, the second question was about uh, balancing the instruments in the room so that the band sounded like the band. Or did you let them set their own levels and you had to control it? Yeah, we, we, it was quite a... I mean, the drums are obviously always loud, and the, uh, which also leads us to your first question, but, uh, and also the, the singing uh, couldn't be heard. Let's say from the drummer, you couldn't hear the singing from there, because we were singing right 
in the room. So, so we need the monitoring system. But yeah, so the only thing that we actually, like the biggest thing that we uh, did in terms of uh, balancing the sound in the room was that we moved out the Leslie speaker in kind of a, a small uh, uh, entrance area where you can close the door. So, so that was standing in there. Uh, and also one of the guitar amps was in there. Um, so those, uh, those were kind of isolated, but it was just a normal door. It wasn't like a proper isolation. But uh, uh, other than that, uh, for the string quartet, I used uh, DPA 4099's uh, microphones on their instruments to get as close as possible and uh, to uh, avoid leakage from everything else. And that worked out really well. Uh, so, but everyone could basically play in, in their own volume. Yeah, but they all had a high, they were always, did see each other? Yeah, yeah, yeah there, there was, every musician could see each other. Yeah. Eric, can we squeeze in one more in the back? Yeah, of course. Thanks for this interesting project. I mean, your music has lots of references to the, let's say, 60s and 70s. Yeah. And analog, um, yeah, Obviously. And stuff. <laughs> Do you think, or could you imagine this project for um, to do this limitations or dogma-like restrictions for a setup with computers and electronics? Because we all know that yeah. the problem of I remember Mesopotamia saying they have terabytes of tracks, and yeah. it was ridiculous to find anything, any music of of with meaning in, of course, there were great tracks maybe, yeah. but um, to get the the yeah, get to the point of the music you want to, want to do. Could you imagine this yeah. setup for another more, let's say, more modern um, or more electronic setup? Yeah, I, I would totally like to do that. I, I've been thinking about it, and uh, also there's been some great papers here presenting uh, now nowadays how, how you take the recorded electronic music uh, items and put it into the live situation. Yeah. And uh, I think it's 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 starting to happen in. I see more and more colleagues who are working with more modern sounds and more modern setups, and they have SPDs and laptops and, and things, but they still play live. Yeah. And uh, I would be thrilled to do such a session uh, at some point with these same type of limitations, because I don't think, it, I, I just think it's, if you're a Baroque uh, quartet playing classical music, then this is obviously a pretty smooth way to record, because then you're used to playing a concert and then it's all good, you know, classical musicians are always on the top. <laughs> but uh, I would be really thrilled to do it with uh, another type of setting. Because if you're like right, your, your idea is to take the opposite thing, like popular music is normally taking a studio production into live performance and yeah. showing this and your idea, your idea would be the opposite. Or, yeah, um, capturing the live performance and just carving yeah. out the via mix and, and uh, balancing yeah. and just light, very light uh, sound uh, improvements and you get you, you get as close as possible to the original feeling of those who are playing that. Yeah. Yeah. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.